Well, we've talked about um, two types of behavior already. We've talked about innate behavior, which we're born with, like reflexes. And we've talked about uh, learned behavior uh, that we acquire over time, such as imprinting or classical or operant conditioning. Uh, today we're going to talk about social behavior, and that is the type of behavior that we uh, exhibit when we're in groups. Uh, it's not easily defined whether it's innate or it's uh, learned, probably a little bit of both, nature and nurture. But uh, let's start off by describing, first of all, what do we mean by a group? There's two different types of groups we can have. Now, the first is simply just an aggregation, right? An aggregation is not really an example of social behavior. It's just a group of animals, individuals who come together, but don't have any particular order, any rules, any special social behavior. The one we're interested in is when they come together and form a society, and a society has rules, it has hierarchy, uh, and very special behavior. Uh, before we begin, let's just briefly make sure people understand what I mean by the difference of society and aggregation. So let's just take a look at these and we'll play a little game here. So what do you think? Beehive. Uh, aggregation or society. Is that a society? Sure it is. There's roles in there. We have bees who are queen bees, drone bees or worker bees. They all have their roles. Queen bees produce the, uh, the uh, new bees. Uh, drones are the males who mate with the queen and the workers uh, get the pollen, make all the honey, build the hive. How about a watering hole? No, that's not really a society. That's an aggregation. A bunch of animals get down there. They just want to have a drink. Uh, there's nobody taking numbers, reservations. Uh, <laughs> it's not first come, first serve. Uh, just whatever down there, no particular rules. How about an IB biology classroom? You might think at first that's an aggregation bunch of students forced to come to period three to take a class but but actually uh, if you think about it most of you guys perform roles I bet if I gave some sort of assignment like I'm going to do today you would quickly break yourself up into roles this personal type this personal research this personal draw uh, this personal wander around the hall aimlessly uh, it's interesting and also I, I don't have a seating chart yet you all seem to sit at the certain tables where your best friends are every time. So you do have some sort of a social gathering here. How about an ant hill? Yeah, same thing. Um, and by the way, ants are organized just like uh, bees are. Uh, all insects are that way pretty much. There are queen ants, uh, workers, drones, and so forth. Tide pool? Nah, it's just whoever washed up in that area there. That would be an aggregation. Okay. Hey, uh, you really don't need to know this, but just kind of fun to be able to pull out some words there. Do you know the names of the societies? So uh, what would lions be? Uh, lions would actually be uh, pride, right? Most of you probably knew that. Um, how about cows? Uh, that's a herd, right? Bees? Hey, most people would say that bees are probably a hive. They're not. Insects exist in swarms. For those of you who read uh, Watership Down, you probably know that rabbits are in a warren. Uh, for those of you who gone up to the uh, San Juan Islands, uh, whales are in pods, and wolves, as we all probably know, are in packs. Okay? So great examples of societies, right? Okay, why do animals exist in societies? Why are some loners, but some are in groups? Well, just like e economics, uh, in some sense, animals do a cost-benefit analysis. And so the benefits have to outweigh the costs if you're going to exist in a society. Same way with people, right? Why do we have laws and rules and so forth? Well, because they're necessary for us to exist in large groups. So I don't have the right to just sit on my porch and shoot a gun at people. That's a right that I give up, but the benefit I get is I have a police department who will protect me, who will make sure people don't come and rob me. So that's my cost benefit. Hey, you don't need to know all of them, but let's just circle a few of the important ones. Uh, costs. Increase competition, most definitely. If you're existing in a small, tightly knit group, you compete for everything, for resources, for breeding rights, uh, for protection, shelter. 
what else? Uh, unfortunately, uh, large groups tend to have more diseases, parasites, diseases. So uh, in human society, for example, cholera, a bacterial infection, is usually occurs in very dense uh, urban sort of areas. What else? Inbreeding. Most definitely. I mean, if you're locked into a tightly knit group, uh, you don't get out very much. Uh, the possibilities for uh, breeding is very small, and the gene pool is small, so inbreeding, which can then lead to uh, weakness, and as we'll see in a moment, animals have come up with a way to uh, deal with that. And what they do is that they go ahead and migrate. So one pack will go on a migration to find another pack, and they'll only be together in a special social behavior uh, during breeding season so that they can increase the gene pool. How about some of the benefits? Well, hopefully there's more benefits, right? Definitely protection. Uh, safety in numbers. A classic example of this would be zebras. Zebras exist in herds. Zebras are um, black and white striped. Why is that? Well, because their major enemy is the uh, lion who pounces on them. But lions actually are colorblind. So what do zebras do when the lion pounces? Well, they don't just run off in one direction. What they do is they, they scatter. They go back and forth. Now imagine you're a lion who can only see black and white. And all of a sudden, a bunch of striped animals go back and forth. That would be extremely confusion, uh, confusing to you. Now, a lion only has about a 30-second window of acceleration to catch a zebra. So if they confuse them enough for that 30 seconds, they all get away. Uh, feeding efficiency here. Uh, I know that kind of sounds like uh, competition. Uh, not quite the same. It basically means that there's a pecking order um, that uh, we all know will be fed, uh, but we have to do it uh, in a certain way. So you might not get as much food as me, but you will be guaranteed to get something. Nobody's going to starve in that group there. Uh, hey, this is probably the major one, right? Division of labor. Everybody gets a job. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't all have to do it yourself. We could go on. There's more benefits, but I think that's pretty good for now. Uh, let's take a look at the next slide here. Uh, social uh, organization. So how are uh, societies organized? Lots of different ways. Uh, here's two ways. One is phases. So in other words, depending on the type of activity, uh, you would organize yourself differently. Uh, the two types I can think of right off the bat are breeding during rutting season. Uh, animals will definitely have different uh, behavior then. And also migration. Uh, when they're on the move to uh, either find water or food or most likely to find another uh, society of animals to interbreed with, uh, their activity, their social behavior will change. An another way they organize themselves is by castes, or what we would think of as hierarchy. So let's do an example, wolves. Uh, wolves are alpha, beta, gamma, and then there's everybody's favorite, the omega wolf. Uh, very interesting. Alpha wolves are the dominant ones. They are the only ones who breed. Uh, the beta wolves are the nurse wolves who take care of the uh, pups. The uh, gamma wolves are the hunters. And the omega wolf <laughs> is the guy on the bottom there. And he actually does serve a purpose. His purpose is pretty much to take the blame. If something goes wrong, the wolves have somebody to blame there. Um, we also have a hierarchy in bees. you got the queen bee, the drones, and the uh, worker bees. Um, we see the same sort of uh, alpha, beta, gamma uh, distribution in elephants and uh, in orca whales. A uh, lot of different animals have this sort of system. How about different types of uh, behavior? So how do they change their social behavior because they live in a society? Well, everybody's favorite one right here would be courtship rituals. Um, Penguins have a very complex courtship ritual. Uh, why do animals do things like that? Because uh, if you're a female and you're going to have uh, babies, you're putting yourself uh, at risk. You're vulnerable for a long time. Uh, you got to sit there. You can't get food and so forth. And so you better be really sure uh, that the male that you're going to breed with was the right guy. 
Uh, they have to be very careful. It's a matter of genes and energy. So they have developed courtship rituals to test uh, to see if you have good genes and if you are going to be a good mate. Aggression. Um, aggression is not the way you would think of in uh, humans. Uh, it's not really fighting. Very few animals will kill each other. Uh, aggression is simply a way to reassert dominance. So, for example, two uh, elk or deer uh, will uh, battle each other with their horns. And then uh, when one wins, the other one will simply give up. And um, they make up and they're fine. Uh, wolves the same way. They will fight and bite but not kill until one finally turns over on his stomach, uh, shows his belly, and then they lick each other, the fight is over, and they've reasserted uh, dominance. Grooming. Uh, chimpanzees love to do this, for example. They'll sit around picking uh, insects off of each other's fur. Cats like to do this to lick each other. What are they doing? It is a bonding ritual. So if you get in trouble in your group there and you've bonded with somebody you know you can depend on them to get you out of trouble. Uh, pecking order means uh, first come, first serve. No, not at all. It means that uh, alphas come before betas and gammas. So when there's food, everybody lines up. They eat in a different order, right? Uh, very interesting, the pecking order for lions. Even though the females go ahead and hunt the food, uh, the male lions, dominant ones, get to eat first. And then, of course, territoriality. Uh, very interesting. Most animals will mark their territory. Uh, dogs and cats do this. Uh, they're very interesting in that dogs will actually mark the outside territory, whereas cats like to mark people. They'll mark you. So if you move to a new neighborhood, uh, dogs have a hard time readjusting. All new trees, all new bushes. Got to go mark out everything anew. But cats have marked people, and the people are still with them, so they tend to adjust a little quicker. Um, a lot of animals have very large territory, and they can tell the difference between the territory of one group from another. For example, wolves can do that. Last thing I want to talk about is two special types of social behavior, natural selection and altruism. Natural selection means, of course, survival of the fittest. Uh, animals at some level understand they must increase uh, the strength of their gene pool. Uh, interesting example of this is black cap birds. They live in Germany. They will migrate to two different places, to Spain where it's warm and to England where it's cold and then they'll uh, lay eggs there uh, and then they'll return to Germany. Uh, they went ahead and did an experiment where they took eggs that were laid in Spain and Germany and they put them on a plane and they flew them back to Germany. And so the black cap birds were hatched in Germany. And then sure enough, later on in the year, the ones that were hatched in Spain flew back to Spain. And the ones that were born uh, hatched in uh, England flew back to England. Somehow they knew the way, some sort of taxis where they can uh, fly based on a knowledge of direction. What's going on here? Well, the climate is warmer, nicer, easier in Spain than it is in England, harsher climate. So the stronger birds were developing in England. So natural selection was picking out those birds to then be the more dominant ones. Hey, the last thing I want to talk about is altruism, uh, which is another word for selfless acts. Uh, this is an idea where uh, one animal will sacrifice itself so that the others can live. A uh, classic example would be a um, group of birds, and one of them sees a hawk coming in, and what does it do? It starts screaming, screeching, sounding the alarm. The other birds fly away. The only problem is the hawk probably zeroes in on that noisy bird, catches it, kills it. So that bird gave its life, so the rest of the flock could uh, get out of there. Uh, why would it do such a thing? Well. Uh, biologists believe that the reason has to do with copies of genes. So yes, you die, but the rest of them get away and the rest of them probably have a copy of your genes already. Why might this be? Well, in small groups, uh, the likelihood is that your genes are already represented. Uh, if there's only 10 lions, for example, in a pride, uh, chances are my genes are represented by my brothers, cousins, and so forth. So even though I physically die as an individual, my genes go on and on. Uh, uh, an easier way to do this would be 
say a mother lion who has five cubs, why would she give her life up? Uh, she loses her genes when she gets killed, but there are five children who have her genes already who go on and survive. Okay, that sounds pretty good, and uh, now we'll try an exercise where you'll all be assigned a different type of animal and try and run through uh, this presentation uh, to analyze it for the types of uh, social behavior.